Jesus paid it all, and it changed everything. He was raised in poverty and lived in obscurity. He never owned a home, never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He possessed neither wealth nor influential position. In his birth, he surprised the king. In his childhood, he puzzled ex experts in the law. In his, <clears throat> in his manhood, he commanded the laws of nature and hushed the storms. He healed the multitudes without medicine and he collected no charge. He never wrote a book, he never went to university, and yet all the libraries <clears throat> in the world could not hold the books written about this man. He never wrote a song, and yet he furnished the theme for more songs than any other song ever written. He, he never studied psychiatry, and yet healed more broken hearts than all the counselors combined. The names of past dignitaries of Rome and Greece have come and gone. The names of great philosophers and theologians and scholars have come and gone. But the name of this man, Jesus, continues to abound. Time was divided into his birth and his death before Christ and Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. But he didn't come to change calendars. He came to change the world. And though over 2,000 years have come and gone since he walked among us, it's not an exagger <clears throat> exaggeration to say that all the armies that ever marched, <clears throat> all the navies that ever sailed, and all the rulers that have ever ruled, and all the kings that have ever reigned have not affected life on earth as much as this one solitary life. And that's why we celebrate the one who paid it all and gave his all for us. What was it about Jesus that changed everything? Uh, it was his life for sure, but even more than that, it was a day. A day that changed everything. It was an event to be even more specific. It was a resurrection. The day he came out of the grave changed everything. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine the imp influence, the impact that Jesus has had in our world. 2,000 years, we still celebrate it. People still sing about it. It changed everything. You know, we have a hard time changing ourselves, let alone the world. Isn't that true? Uh, poor Easter Bunny went in to try to change, went in to see his psychiatrist. And uh, he says, I don't know, Doc, I just feel so hollow inside. There's got to be more to it. Or another time when he went to visit, I don't know where those eggs come from, and I certainly don't know, um, how to, uh, know why I hide them. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe you feel a little bit like that. You don't know and you don't understand why things happen the way they do, and and we seem powerless to change them. And yet Jesus had such a powerful impact. We still talk about it. I was uh, recently had the privilege of, of uh, spending some time in Israel. And as we were driving in a bus, I saw this picture. And I shot, took a picture through the window of the bus and of a grave uh, with a stone in front of it. Um, I thought, oh, that maybe just like Jesus. It was nowhere near Jerusalem, but I said, look at that. There's graves like that over there. The thing about it, when you get to Jerusalem, the grave of Jesus isn't there anymore. Uh, for centuries, people have ransacked the city and that grave and broken it and destroyed it and eventually built a church on top of it and to mark the spot. So you don't see it anymore. It's but it perhaps looks something like this. And when you look at it, one of the things, at least for me, when I, when I looked at it is, is uh, that stone must have been heavy. 
Can you imagine trying to roll that, that thing? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three of the gospel writers, all talk about this stone that was rolled. And so it probably looks something like this, to roll over the entrance of the tomb. But that would be quite a job. It says in Matthew 27, Matthew records that he rolled, and this would be speaking of a guy named Joseph of Arimathea, he rolled a big stone, emphasis on the big stone, right? A big stone in, in front of the entrance to the tomb and, and went away. And I think it said he, singular, really? One guy? Big? Well, we know also Nicodemus was there, and, and maybe the two of them were able to move it, but it was a big stone. But they moved it over and pushed it so that it covered the entrance to the tomb, and then they went away after burying the body of Jesus. Do you hear the joke going around about this, uh, this Joseph? He guess he went to see Pilate to get permission to take Jesus down from the cross and put him in the grave. And Pilate says to him, he says, I, I can't believe that, that you would give that, I mean, that was right in the garden area there, and you spent a lot of money buying that plot of land and, and time digging that, you know, carving out that stone grave, and, and you're just going to give it away to, to Jesus? And, and uh, uh, Joseph responds, oh, it's okay. He only needs it for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, Luke goes on to say, that the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. So they were there watching these guys as they, as they put the body of Jesus, as they, they wrapped him and put him in the grave. And, and they knew the spot. They knew where Jesus' grave was. And they also noticed how his body was laid in it. And they noticed the guys did a rather quick job. And they thought to themselves, we're going to have to come back here after the Passover and fix this. And so, it's, but before that happens, it says the next day, so this would be now be Saturday, the next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate and, and said, Sir, uh, we remember uh, that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. It's interesting, even the enemies, even Jesus' enemies and, and non-believers understood what Jesus is, was planning to do. They understood, that, and Jesus made it very clear, that he was going to die and that he would rise again on the third day. And, and they knew that. And they wanted to make sure it didn't happen. So they go and talk to, uh, <coughs> to uh, Pilate. And, and, and it says, uh, goes on to say, so, so give the order, they, they, they asked, uh, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. We, we just can't let that happen. So Pilate says, take a guard. Right? Now go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. Fortify it, guard it, do whatever you need to make sure Jesus does not come out of the tomb. So they went and made the tomb secure by doing two things, putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. We don't know exactly what a seal would be, but generally in those days, a seal would be made with wax. So possibly... They took the, some rope, maybe, and, and tied the stone and then put a, a blob of wax and, and put the rope in it. And as it cooled, they put a signet ring of the Roman, knowing that if you broke a seal of the Romans, it was a death penalty. And, and they wanted to make sure nobody came, you know, rolled the stone and then rolled it back. And so they sealed it to make sure nobody, if someone was away... Uh, made sure that uh, nobody opened this in for penalty of death. The other thing they did, not only a seal, but they posted guards. And in fact, there must have been at least four guards. Because we know later in the story when Jesus rises, that at least two, it says plural, the guards went to tell them, but it sounds like this among all, some of the guards stayed at the tomb. So there had to be at least two and two, so four, probably eight 
which is a little, it seems strange to me that you needed eight guys to guard a dead man. But they knew, they knew what Jesus had said. And so they ensured that Jesus stayed in the tomb. But then Mark tells us in Mark 16, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body because the guys had done a rush, rush job. And so they, they, uh, this would be on the Sabbath, like when the Sabbath was over, this would be like Saturday night. Sabbath started 6 o'clock Friday night. So 6 o'clock Saturday night, it had ended. So in the evening, they went and bought some spices and stuff before going to sleep. And then very early the next morning, uh, verse 2 says, <clears throat> on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on their way up to the tomb, which means they, they probably got up before sunrise, got their stuff around, and it was still dark, which is a powerful image because their hearts felt dark too and heavy. Jesus had died. And this was not going to be a, a pleasant thing to do, go and do. And so their hearts were heavy, and their it was dark inside and outside. But they went to the tomb to perform a ritual, you know, to wrap the body, do the burying, to, and, but they ex experienced a miracle. And that's what Easter is about. Maybe some of you came to, to uh, perform a ritual, you know, do the Easter thing, come out, but, but it's our prayer and our hope that you would experience a miracle, just like happened on that first Easter. Anyway, so they're on their way up to the tomb, right, just after sunrise, and they ask each other, who is going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Remember, it's a big stone. They have a 2,000-pound problem. How are they going to move it? It's too heavy for us. It's early in the morning. Nobody else is here. They were probably unaware that guards had been posted and a seal has been put, or they wouldn't be able to get in anyways. And they didn't know that because that happened on Saturday. Anyway, so they go, and the stone's too heavy for us. Now what do we do? But they looked. It says they looked up as they approached, and they saw the stone, which was very large, and it had been rolled away. It had been rolled away. They think, how is that possible? You know, how, how and what, what's going on here? How did the stone just roll away? You know, Matthew tells us, we jump over to Matthew, Matthew 28, he'll, he gives us a story of what happened there. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. He sat there on the grave, as if waiting for people to show up. They just sat there. And the guards, their reaction, it says, the guards were so afraid of him, the angel, that they shook and became like dead men, which is so ironic, right? The guy in the tomb who's supposed to be dead is alive, and the guards outside the tomb who are supposed to be alive are acting like dead men. You know, it's, it's funny that what feels lifeless and hopeless sometimes uh, there is, there is always hope with a God who can do anything. An all-powerful God who can even raise the dead. <clears throat> and then, as I was thinking about this whole image, a, a question that I wanted to address this morning, the, re the rest of my time, is this. Why did he roll back the stone? Why did the angel roll the stone back? Maybe you've pictured Jesus inside the tomb and, and he comes alive again somehow and he takes off the bandages and he's out trying to push this big stone by himself and it's too heavy and so an angel has to come down and give him a push too. Well, no, it didn't happen that way. In fact, it says that that evening, let me just show you a verse. That evening after the resurrection, it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, on Stone Sunday, when the, the disciples were together with the doors locked, right? No one could get in and out. Why? For fear that, of the Jewish leaders, because they thought maybe that they'd get thrown up on the cross just like Jesus was crucified. And so they were afraid. And then Jesus, in this locked room, Jesus 
came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. How did you do that, Jesus? The doors are locked. He just appeared. Well, see, in his post-resurrection body, doors and stones don't need to be opened and moved. Well, if that's true, then why did he roll back the stone in the grave? Well, it certainly wasn't to let Jesus out. So why did he do it? And I think there are four reasons, and I think you need to think about that a little bit because of the significance of why that stone was rolled back. And the first reason he did it was to invite you to investigate. You see, we needed to see what was in that tomb. We needed to see that it was empty. The soldiers looked in, saw it was empty, and went and reported to the Jews, the body's gone. The disciples... Uh, had to go and see it. When they first learned, they ran to the tomb. They needed to see it. No doubt the Jewish leaders who posted the guard went and checked it out too. He's gone. No one produced a body. My faith needed that. It was a very public death. It was a very public empty tomb. And then, very publicly, he walked around and talked to people over the next 50 days. You see, he was inviting us to, to look in it. In fact, that's what the, um, the angel said on the tomb. Mark 16, verse 6 says this. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified? He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Come and look. Check it out. Investigate. See, the reason he rolled the stone away was so that we could look inside and see that there was, the tomb was empty. There's a guy uh, named uh, J. Warner Wallace. He's a forensic homicide detective. He spent his life going to crime scenes and studying uh, people who have been killed and trying to f- solve and figure out who it was. And, and uh, he wrote a book that uh, I would highly recommend if you are interested in this sort of thing called Cold Case Christianity. When he went back and applied all the, his skills of forensic science to uh, the grave of Jesus. And he, t- he tells a story when, when he was a, a young man, he, was, uh, he wasn't brought up as a believer, uh, in fact, when his, it wasn't until his boys, he had a couple of boys he, that were born to, in the family, and, and his wife said, maybe we should take them to church. What do you think? And he's le- like, well, I guess we could do that. I mean, it's, it's the church, you know, they, they teach a kind of useful delusion, right? That's kind of his view, he called it, a useful delusion. You know, it wasn't true. But it was helpful in society to have a church and have, you know, good morals and values and stuff. So so maybe it would be good to take them. Well, he he says he went to church on that (coughs) first Sunday. And uh, the pastor said something that made him just stop and think. He said that Jesus was the smartest person that ever lived. At first, he kind of laughed at that and said, (laughs) but then he started thinking about the impact 2,000 years later, he was still having on the world. And so he decided to buy a Bible and and to read the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as he was reading through, he said, and and this is what impressed him as a forensic scientist, he said, when you come to a a crime scene, the one thing you need to do is uh, immediately, right away, is separate all the witnesses. And then take them to a a room by themselves and interview each of them separately. Because he says, the one thing you will never, ever see at a crime, and and it'll never, um, it it never happens at a crime scene, is the witnesses will never agree on the events. Everyone saw it from a different perspective. And he says, that's what helps them put the story together. He says, if everyone has the same story, we know that they've colluded together and the testimonies fall apart. But when they're different, when there's a different perspective or different twist, same story, obviously, but they saw different facts, then we know that's the ring of truth. And he says, as I was reading through the four accounts of Jesus' life, he said, it rang true as a homicide detective 
When I studied it, it rang true. And then he said, when that dude walked out of the grave, I knew I had to listen to him because I've never seen that before. <laughs> and he's seen lots of dead people. And so <clears throat> he ended up becoming a follower of Christ and writing a book, laying out all the evidence. And it's pretty overwhelming. And somehow, for some of you, you need that. Some of you need to know. And, and that's why the tomb was opened, so you could look and you could see and you could investigate it for yourself. I mean, you can't physically, but all the evidence of the testimonies can all be studied. The, the, second, the second reason that stone was rolled away is to show God's, show you God's incomparable power. And, and I'm not really talking about just the ability to roll a stone away. I mean, that would have taken some power. But not that impressive, really, right? The power I'm talking about is the power that defeated death. The power that, that, that couldn't hold Jesus in the tomb, that, that, all, that brought him back to life. An incomparable power. It's like nothing um, is too difficult. Nothing is insurmountable with God. I love what Paul writes about this in, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask and think. Imagine, more than we could even imagine. Right? According to his power. See, there's no limit to his power. More than we could ask, more than we could even think. And then he closes with the amazing statement that is at work within us the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead at work in us. It's a powerful thought. And, and opening the grave shows His power, the empty tomb. The, the third thing, as I was thinking about rolling the stone, why did the angel roll the stone back? It was to inspire hope in you. Because as people looked into that grave, they realized, ah, there is a life beyond death. Maybe there is a heaven. Maybe I'll see my loved ones again. I mentioned a month ago being part of my father-in-law's funeral and, and, and knowing that someday I'll see him again creates hope, doesn't it? Death is not the end. And when we look into that grave, the angel rolled back that stone because he wanted you to know this is not the end of the story. It goes on. There is a resurrection. Life continues. Paul talks about this in the book of Corinthians in chapter 15. He writes a whole chapter about this. He starts the chapter off by saying, uh, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that we raised again on the third day. And so he, he lays this out, this, this central teaching to the church, and then he talks about it the rest of the chapter. Well, what if that didn't happen? I mean, your faith would be useless. You're wasting your time. But if it's true, think, think about the implication of that. And, and so he spends the chapter talking about the resurrection, and then at the very end, he says this, in verse 52, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And what Paul is saying is there is a resurrection. It will happen. Just like Jesus, who rose from the dead, you will rise from the dead. Death is not the end. And the implications are astounding. You see, death breaks God's heart too. It wasn't part of his plan. It was a result of sin as we turned our backs on him. And so he did something about it. He sent Jesus to die on a cross to give us the hope that there is forgiveness, that there is a place in heaven and a relationship with God available. And the fourth reason, the fourth reason that the angel rolled back that stone was to provide an invitation for you to believe. 
to come in and, and believe. That's exactly what happened to the disciples. When they heard the, the, the grave was empty and they said Jesus was gone, the first thing they did is they got up and they ran to the graveyard. Right? And it says in uh, John 20, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. When he walked into that tomb, it changed everything for him. It really is. He is the Messiah. He did what he said he would do. And he believed. And the question is, do you? Based on their testimonies and the overwhelming witnesses, the growth of the church, whatever, the changed lives, do you believe? It's not always easy, and that's why uh, starting next week, I'm going to begin a series. I'm simply titling the, the Physics of Faith. Can a smart person have faith? Can a smart person have faith? Or is faith and logic or faith and reason incompatible, are they? I was speaking to a guy, uh, this was a few years ago. I just remember, just we had talked about the gospel and we talked about following Jesus and, and he says you know I, I believe I believe and I believe Jesus died I believe yeah he probably even rose again but I don't really want to be a follower of his and, and uh, I said why and he said well life has been good and, and I'm not really looking to change anything I, I don't need a change in my life and so I had to think about it. Well, what do you say to a guy who doesn't really need it? At least he feels he doesn't. But I think he forgot two important things that I want to close with. And these are the two symbols around Easter. The first one is the cross. The cross. And this little st statement that I thought was kind of cute, but hopefully it would be memorable. One cross plus three nails equals forgiven. You see, the problem that he wasn't looking at is that he needed to be forgiven too. We all need to be forgiven because we all have sinned. Even though we may not want to admit it, when we really think about it, and if we're honest with ourselves, yeah, we've hurt people, we've hurt ourselves, we've hurt God, we've done things wrong. We need to be forgiven. And the second thing, the other symbol of Easter, the cross is one, and this other one is the stone. And I, to keep consistent with the number four, I said forever. You need to be forgiven. You need to remember forever. Now, you need to remember that eternity is real. That Jesus showed us that there is life beyond death. And eternity is a real place. In fact, when you think of eternity, life becomes like a dot on a long line of eternity. Forever is real. I've talked to you about roll the stone this morning and, and that it invites us to investigate. Investigate, come and see. It, invites, it, it shows us that there's an incomparable power. It, it shows us that it inspires hope in us that there really is a, a life beyond, the de beyond death. And then it invites you to believe. And even when you feel like you don't need it, maybe you haven't considered you need to be forgiven too. If you want to have a relationship with God, a perfect God in heaven, and you want to live on forever and eternity with, in, with Him, then those two reasons I think everyone needs. And so when you see the number four in the next week, remember, we all need to be forgiven and we all have an eternity ahead. Don't miss it. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time we've had to consider the cross and the stone and the empty tomb. Thank you, Lord, for, for reminding us that we really do have something amazing to celebrate that as horrible as Good Friday was, 
how wonderful Easter Sunday is. As Jesus came out of the grave and showed himself to so many people. Lord, I just pray for those people here this morning that need that reminder because life's been hard. <clears throat> There's been difficult things you've had to deal with. And to know that there's an eternity ahead just helps us to put that in per perspective. And just knowing there's a God who can do anything just helps us to realize that we'll be okay. And Lord, for those who have who've been struggling to believe, maybe this morning is the time they say, yeah, I need to believe. I need to take that step of faith. If that's what you feel you need to do in your heart right now, just, just say something like this to the Lord, just, just to yourself. Just say, Lord Jesus, he hears your heart. Lord Jesus, I, I need to be forgiven. And, and, and I want to be in heaven for eternity. And, and I want that relationship with you. Please forgive my sin. And I accept your gift of eternal life. I believe you died. I believe you rose again on the third day. And I believe you did it for me. And that's all you have to communicate to God. And when you do so, you become a follower of his. You step into his family. And then it's a process of growing and following together that We'd love to have you join with us as we continue to grow together. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had now and just pray your blessing on us as we close off the service. In Jesus' name, amen.